and I might mention that uh, we, we had, uh, speaking of life, uh, Greg Williams stole my sermon. <laughs> I might as well sit down. He does that all the time, doesn't he? He, talk, he talked about Mary and Marcia. That's what I'm supposed to be talking about. Wow. Just expand, huh? Wow. Um, in fact, he gave the exact same scripture. Luke 10, verse 38 through 42. Maybe we need it. You think you do? Oh, wow. Well, okay, like Melissa said, I'll just expand. Um, Huh? There's always a hidden nugget. A hidden nugget. You guys are making me feel better. <laughs> Let's start with prayer. Father, we come before you. We thank you so very much for the many, many blessings that you do give us and the opportunity to come and worship you and to relax. It is a hectic world that we live in. And Father, there's peace and there's solace with you. Be with us in this sermon. Help us to understand that even more. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, I might mention that Greg Williams is following the lectionary too. So that's why we cross paths so much. <laughs> they take a nugget from that whole thing and they present it. And those of us that might be following the lectionary, what we, we, chances are, be speaking on the same thing. Not every time, but many times. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. That was to him and his disciples as they traveled. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed one only. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So we had a situation where Jesus and his disciples were probably in Jerusalem, and they decided that they would uh, travel a little distance, so they went to the small village of Bethany, from Jerusalem, which is only about two miles. So they left Jerusalem, traveled to, to Bethany. And um, Martha realized that they were en route to the city of Bethany where she and Mary and Lazarus, her brother, were. So she invited them in for dinner. She had decided to prepare a great meal for them. Jesus and his disciples welcomed the invitation as guests and went in, relaxed, and just began to have a conversation. <laughs> Can you imagine? Now, we know that Fran is a great hostess. But can you imagine Jesus along with 12 grown men coming in and she said, come on in, I'm going to fix you dinner. 12 grown men? Jesus was 33. <laughs> so the disciples had to be 20s, 30s, 40s. Big guys. Fisher. <laughs> Fishermen. Don't look at me. I'm not that big. You <laughs> <laughs> were a big guy. I'm coming in to eat. She said, come on in. I'm going to prepare a meal for you. So they graciously accepted her invitation, went in and began to sit down, relax, and have a conversation. Jesus was always teaching, 
and the disciples were listening and asking questions, as was Mary. Jesus always had something interesting, stimulating, and fulfilling to talk about. And Mary was right there in the mix. She was glued to everything that Jesus was saying. Verse 39 says, She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. You know, when I get uh, to, to verse 39 and read verse 39 about, about uh, Mary being so inquisitive, I'm reminded of the time when Marilyn and I first met. A long time ago. In fact, uh, we first met at, um, during the day, Days of Unleavened Bread, the early spring festivals in 1966. And in six weeks, we were both graduating from high school. I was in Cincinnati, and we had this festival, and all the church areas around came to it. You know, Dayton, Ohio, Indianapolis, to Cincinnati, uh, uh, Detroit, I think, a lot of areas. There was a special speaker. And so it was the last day, I think it was a three-day event, and then you know how the guys are, they always lay back. And the last minute, oh, I better get my notebook and get some names. <laughs> so we get our, you know, everybody's getting ready to go, and we get our names, start taking down names. And so um, I was relegated only to the African Americans, because that's what we thought back then. So we saw these, you know, these girls, and we go over and get their names and write their names down. First one I saw was Vera, Marilyn's middle sister. I went up to Vera. I said, "Hello, I'm so, you know, can, can I get your name and you know maybe give you a call?" So she gave me her name and she asked me how old I was, and I told her I think I was 17, 18 at the time, just about ready to be 18. And she said, "Well, you might want to talk to my sister, because my sister is also graduating in June." Vera was four years younger. I went over to Maryland, got her name, and, and you know, plus a lot of other ladies, girl, young, young girls. And so, lo and behold, about a week or two later, I get this letter from Maryland saying, well, you know, I'm graduating too in, in June, uh, and I'm not going to my senior prom because there's no guys today. Well, I wasn't going to mine because there was no girls today. So I said, this might be a pretty nice thing. <laughs> so I checked with my parents, and they said, well, it's OK. You know, you can go. So I hop Greyhound, go leave Cincinnati, come to Indianapolis, and take her to her senior prom. It was great. The father was the head of the house, the mother and the three girls, all just nice, and girls helping in the kitchen and all that stuff. Now, you had Marilyn, who was at the time 17. She came out a year early. You had Vera that was four years younger. And you had Rachel, who was seven. No, she was three. She was three. Rachel was 14 years younger. Marilyn was 17. Rachel was three. So I come, you know, and I sit on a couch. And Marilyn sits over here on the other side of the couch, and we start talking, or just communicating, talking. But Rachel, three, comes up, and she looks in my eyes. She puts her hands on my leg. <laughs> wow, those big puppy dog eyes. <laughs> oh, Albert, I don't believe you're here. <laughs> she was, it was, you know, she must have heard about me or something. <laughs> but you know, I, I get the feeling that that's the way Mary was. Big puppy dog eyes. Looking up at Jesus, just infatuated by what he's saying. It's all this good stuff that's coming in, stuff she had never heard before. It is a new covenant. covenant new test, New covenant that he's teaching. They have been hearing all this other stuff, the do's and the don'ts, and 
you know, you're cursed if you do this, you're cursed if you do that. But Rachel would come up to me and just look up. And Marilyn says, how can you touch him? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so it was interesting. But Martha, who was the gracious host of this special occasion, was getting more and more upset with her sister Mary by the minute as Mary listened to Jesus and as she, Martha, was left to take care of all the household chores, all the preparation for this special meal, she had to do it all by herself. So after Marcia, Martha had had about as much as she could take, she marches into the other room. And verse 40 says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. My sister is neglecting her responsibilities. My sister should be helping me. I'm doing all of this work of preparing this meal by myself. Martha's attitude also kind of accused Jesus. But she says, uh, you know, don't you care that my sister has left all this work for me to tell her what to do. So she was, you know, a little ticked at Jesus as well. Okay, but notice what Jesus said to Martha in verses 41 and verse 42. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will, be not, it will not be taken away from her. Now, Jesus' mild rebuke of Martha said, as I just quoted, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. And Martha was truly upset with her sister. Instead of of helping in the kitchen with all the preparation, with the details, and with the setting of the table, Mary was there listening at Jesus' feet. Was there sitting at Jesus' feet listening, being spiritually filled, taking it all in, and in a sense, worshiping Jesus. I'm amazed at the number of songs that we sang today about worshiping Jesus, this very last song, worshiping Jesus. The other song that we sang, I wrote down the title, Lord, here I am to worship. Here I am to say that you are my God. You're altogether worthy, altogether lovely, altogether wonderful to me. That's the attitude. I um, took the liberty of uh, getting the definition of a few words. And so I, in my study, I, I looked up about three different words. Worship. Worship is the act of paying honor to a dignity. Religious reverence or homage. The feeling and expression of high adoration, reverence, trust, love, loyalty, and dependence upon a higher power. That's what worship is. And then the word devotion. Let me back up. I gave you the definition of worship. What's your reverence to God? What's your loyalty to God? Is he a part of your life every day? Do you seek homage in him in your daily activities? 
You know, I heard a pastor say on the radio years ago, he said, you know, Christians don't even have sense enough to say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy in this situation that I'm in. They won't even cry out to him. Do you pray for daily guidance and direction, seeking his will in your life daily? Devotion. Devotion is, the, is, is uh, defined as love, loyalty, and enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause. If you feel loyal or loving towards someone or something, that's devotion. And then again, I gave an example. If uh, your devotion to your pet hamster knows no limit, then you might splurge on a gold, solid gold hamster wheel. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's reverence, that's respect, and that's love. <gasps> solid gold wheel for my hamster to run around in. Okay? <laughs> that's, you know, that, that, that's really showing respect. The other word is, is meditation. That is worshiping God in thought. David said, oh, how love I your law. I meditate on it all day long. The life of a Christian the life of someone following Christ. So we have worship, we have devotion, and we have meditation. And we can see these things in the life of, of Mary toward her Savior. Martha, many things are distracting you, and Mary has chosen what is better it will not be taken away from her. Now, uh, you have here sisters with two types of personalities. One, Martha has an A-type personality. You know what an A-type personality is. Let's get it done and on time. Okay? No time to waste. Everybody knows what his or her responsibilities are, so be on it. That's an A personality. You know, kind of the Peter type of a personality. Now, Mary was a laid-back personality. Let's have a conversation. Let's share. Don't you hate those kind of people? <laughs> An A-type personality does. <laughs> Let's share. Uh, stuff will get done. I'm truly connecting. We're truly connecting. Uh, but you know, it was even more than that with Mary. She was consumed by every thought that came from Jesus. She listened intently to what Jesus was explaining. She had a thirst for righteousness. Verse 41. Martha, Martha, Jesus said, You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, there's several things that we need to consider when we look at this point that Jesus is making here. Jesus said, Martha, many things have worried and upset you. Many things have distracted you. The physical things, the planning, the details, the meticulousness. Is that right? Meticulousness 
Martha was known for being meticulous and having everything just right. That's what she wanted. There, there is really only one thing worthy of being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and I won't take it away from her. That's what the Living Bible says is. True worship and devotion to me. True worship and devotion to me. That's what we have to think about. Now, please um, understand what, what I'm saying here. Jesus did not out and out rebuke Martha by saying that she was wrong. Certain things are important to some people and not to other people. Martha was upset with her sister because she didn't see things the way that Mary saw them. Martha was right about wanting help on such an important occasion. She was okay. She was right for wanting the help. However, Jesus said that Mary had something better. And I will not take that away from her. True personal worship and devotion to me. There's a fine mix. I mean, there's a fine balance. There's a fine balance. Overall, the things we have to do and get accomplished in this busy life, they affect us all. Overall, the distractions that keep us sidelines, we see them day by day by day. Overall, the friends, relatives, children, grandchildren, associates that vie for our time. It's there. But where is prayer, Bible study, devotionals, meditation in our lives? Where are those things? I, I used to poo-poo devotionals. But I have come to find that devotionals are tremendous. You know, if I couldn't just sit down for 30 minutes and take my Bible... <laughs> and open it up and read it. What's a devotional? They say take you know five or ten minutes with this devotion, but I need to sit down, take my Bible, and open it up and just be reading scripture. No, uh, these people that put these devotions together have really a great thing going. And they keep the story flow going, and you can just start the next day. Or if you miss a day, just maybe catch up, whatever. All right, so prayer, Bible study, devotionals, meditation, those things are important. We need to prioritize our time, and worship is, a priori is the priority over service. Worship is a priority over service. Time in a personal relationship with God is priority over services, even in the church. And many pastors have to realize that. Many pastors say, hey, you know, I'm just leave home at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the morning, gone all day, taking care of church work, and don't have time for anything else. So there's got to be the balance to prioritizing. Well, I'm about ready to close. So daily maintaining that personal relationship with God, daily maintaining that personal relationship with God over all of the physical things in life, all of the details in life, work, 
people, all of the personal priorities in life, Jesus said that worship is the better way. I listed down that song that we sang today, Here I Am to Worship. That's what's most important. Father, thank you so very much. We need to prioritize our lives. And thank you, Father, for a story such as Mary and Martha for us to see that physical things are all right to get done. And they do stack up on us. But we can't put them before our personal relationship with you. Thank you. Be with us and help us in the coming coming days to put this to practice in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.